you are audible okay okay so about that first of all about that question bert and gpt so bert and gpt are completely different architectures developed over the concept that was proposed by the paper attention is all you need now attention is all you need just created a, a simple architecture using uh, multi head attention layers okay uh, however uh, it just created a sequence to sequence uh, uh, architecture okay uh, but gpt and bird are like other architectures based on the concept of multi head attention there are many different things in it uh, a lot of uh, so we will share the resources for them what the, what is the difference see you can uh, to compare that with cnn's what you have studied so you can see that the very first paper of cnn like the alexnet so we covered alexnet okay and then we in alexnet we have shown what is a convolutional layer so we have covered the paper attention is all you need a very basic paper in which we have shown what is an mha now using that mha that is using that convolutional layer many different architectures have come restnet inception net but the core but all of them have used the convolutional layer similarly using this multi head attention layer a lot of different architectures have come uh, two of the more, most common and most used architectures are bert and gpt uh, for more details what's exactly bert and what exactly is gpt and how they work and how they are trained and how they can be used we will share the resources uh, when we share everything okay so what the, what is the task that we want, i'm going to do is we are going to do a task called sequence to sequence uh especially for uh language translation so we are going to create a basic language translator between english and french okay so our own language translator that's what we are going to create we are going to see two different approach, approaches for this one is an lstm based sequence to sequence and one is the attention is all you need paper based uh, attention based or mha based sequence to sequence modules okay so uh, the reason i've shown this is this is my data set okay so there are a lot of things about this data set but what you need to see is so each line has one data point okay the first thing in the line is the word in english and then the second thing in the line is the word in french okay so we can see that uh, whenever there is who in english there is some corresponding in french and not just words if we go later on so a bit of phrases see i like my life the way it is now so this is a phrase in english and this is the french uh, translation for that phrase and if we go let uh, more deeper into this data set like at the end of the data set we can see that there are proper paragraphs uh, whose translation has been given so for example there there's this paragraph it may be impossible to get a completely error free corpus due to the nature of this kind of collaborative effort however if we encourage members to contribute sentences in their own language rather than experiment in languages they are learning we might be able to minimize errors so this is a complete paragraph and this paragraph whole from english to french uh, translation is given as a training data so this is the french of this whole paragraph there's a translation so this is my training data it contains 190206 Uh, so one ninety thousand, one lakh ninety thousand samples. So this is the data set that we're going to use to create our sequence to sequence models. Okay. Ah, uh, we are not going to that much to see about data training, validation, testing. Those things we are not going to see much. We are not going to care too that much. We'll be testing on the training data itself. But the main crux is how to create these sequence to sequence models because creating these models is not at all straightforward. Uh, straightforward. Uh, it's a bit. You basically you have already seen two different types of uh, model creation systems: sequential and functional. For 
creating sequence to sequence, you need to see a third different kind of model creation system that's called subclassing. Okay, so you cannot create these models by sequential or functional and I will come to it why? So we are not going to that much focus upon the data set, what's training data, what testing data, and how we are formulating the data set. We are more going to focus about because that's just normal Python code. But we are more going to focus about how to create these models and how to train these models and how to test these models. That's one another difficulty in these models is that the training model is different from the testing model, which I will again come a bit later on that. Why is that so? Okay. So, but the task is that we want to create uh, our own language translation system, which can translate English to French. Okay. So for that first what we are going to see, we're going to see an LSTM based sequence to sequence model. Okay. Now this LSTM based sequence to sequence model uh, is basically, so how I can draw this. So I have, uh... hello, okay. Yeah, another thing, we are going to do a character to character level. So in this case, each character is a token for us. Okay, so in most of the previous cases, what sir must have been showing you the cases and completion must have been showing you that uh, the word was the whole token that the system was seeing, but we are taking the character edge at a token. Okay, so hello needs to be translated to, let's say bonjour. Okay. So what's the main complexity? Hello has one, two, three, four, five characters. Bonjour has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters. Okay. So first of all, we don't know what will be the number of characters in input, what will be the number of characters in output. So that's a very first um, problem. Another problem in such a translation can be that in many languages, the way the noun verb comes, uh, comes they're completely different. Okay, so in some languages noun comes initially, but in some languages noun comes later on. Okay, so for example, I can just take uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, I can say a sentence that Dutch lives in Bangalore. Okay, okay, but it's, it's Hindi translation can be Dutch Bangalore. So Bangalore was a word that actually came at the last of the sentence in English, but it came at the starting in Hindi. Okay, so we need to make sure that once we start translating, we have the whole context of the input because we never know what part of the context may we require in the starting, may we require at the end. So we are, we cannot is if we have no idea that maybe the uh, context that was at the end of the in input sentence, maybe that's the starting context for the translated uh, sequence. So that's why sequence to sequence models are a bit different than normal models. Okay, so how they are done is that we have an input. Uh, okay, wait, wait a sec, I will just, so we have an input. So it's a sequence of input, okay. So we will pass it to an embedding layer and then we will pass it through an LSTM. So this is one of the ways we draw LSTMs to show that there are neurons, but the neurons are temporally connected. Okay, now the LSTMs gives us an output and there's a state of the LSTM. So this is something, the state of the LSTM is something that has the context of the whole sequence of the whole sentence that we were having. So it has every information that what was the noun, what was the pronoun, uh, whether there were, uh, I was talking about plurals, I was talking about singulars, how many nouns were there, uh, whether there were some cities, what were the name of the cities, whether the activity, which activity was living, running, what kind of activity. So all of this information is in the state, final state of this LSTM. Now we are going to use this final state uh, for creating the French language. So there's going to be now and LS again, uh, LSTM. For that, this final state will go as the input state to this LSTM. And 
initially we will here we will have a start token okay and then here will be a first word that is b in our case for bonjour then this b will go here and then our second word then this second word will go here and then our third word and so on so this is how the architecture will be so this will be an encoder and uh, this will be an decoder for training purposes we won't do it in this way for training purposes the way we will do it is completely different so for training purposes what we will do it is we will have b o and g so so we will have a right shifted uh, input okay we will have a right shifted input and then in the outputs will be b o and g u so for corresponding to for corresponding to sorry a start token we will have b corresponding to b we will have o corresponding to o we will have n so in training the, this whole will be the system while in testing we will first uh, input the start system then we will get b then we will input the b then we will get o then we will input the o then we will get n so there are two very fundamental network designing uh, designs are there when it comes to training and testing because in training we can input the complete uh, french sentence okay but while testing we don't have the complete french sentence so that's why there are two different designs and moreover there's an information share that's happening via some other entity rather than the output of a layer so usually when we were creating layers previously all the information share was happening from at least outputs of the layers okay but here the information share is not happening from any output of the layer to an input of a layer so the information share is completely different different so because of this information share is completely different we cannot use a uh, uh, sequential uh, based models and since the type of model that we want to create for training and testing are also different we cannot use a functional based models so that's why we need to go for sub modeling using subclassing that's how we can create such models but this is the overall architecture that we want to create that we have a input sequence so this is my input sequence i will first convert it into embeddings then i will input it to the encoder encoder will finally give me a final state once i have achieved this final state then i will start my decoding business so in testing the decoding business will go one character at a time but in training since i already know the whole sentence i can go full sentence at a time so this will be the system that we want to create so is this clear to everybody what is the system that we want to code so can you please explain why the sequential or functional models cannot be used once again yeah so so in sequential models what was happening was that i was having one layer okay i was having one layer then over that I stacked another layer, then over that I stacked another layer using those add functions, right? So, so once we're using an add function, the limitation of what can be done by the function is fixed, okay? So what add function does is, so given a previous layer, it's output. So it will take the output of the previous layer and give it as an input to the next layer. So that's what an add function does. It's a very basic function, which takes the output of the previous layer and give it as an input to the next layer okay so whenever the networks have branches multiple inputs and multiple outputs so during that time the sequential modeling cannot be done cannot be done so because you can see here so in this case this lstm basically has two inputs okay one is coming from here and one is coming from here right so they are having two inputs so now if i add this lstm over the embedding layer for uh, 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 for my French uh, over the embedding layer of my French, then what would happen? It can only take the input from the French words. It cannot take the input from the L, uh, encoder. But if I add it after the encoder, so let's say if I add it here, okay, then also it cannot take this hidden state as an input. It can only take the output of the encoder. So uh, whenever we use sequential APIs, things are very limited. Uh, for us uh, that what we can do we can only create a single stacked networks using sequential api we cannot create uh branched out networks using sequential api so that is the reason we cannot use sequential api 
now then we can create branched networks using functional api we have seen in the vae and autoencoders vae was a highly branched network and we created it using functional api right okay so why we cannot create is because see the testing and training networks are completely different so for training this whole is a single network in which there's a sequence there's a sequence there's a sequence right this whole is a single network for training but for testing what would happen is that first we will have an english sentence complete we will run the encoder completely and get this so in testing we have gotten this so this is the very first step then comes the second step then given this we will first have the first word here so here we will have the first word from the first word we will input the first word we will, sorry here we have the start token so from the start token we will get the first word then we will input the first word here then using that first word we will get the second word then we will input the second word here then third so this is completely uh, iterative process here so here is a completely iterative process that's happening that from one word to next word to next word so since training and testings are completely different models but we need to have those two models having the same weights so that's why we cannot use functional api as well okay so thank you yeah Daksha, one confusion i have the way uh, you are saying like you are saying uh, it word by word or alphabet by alphabet sorry alphabet by alphabet okay so yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that, uh, then other another question is that like uh, suppose i saw in your training data we have word to word mapping like uh, hello is having corresponding bonds or as a meaning so, so why... that was just for some initial data so i have seen the pre down data as well some complex data so that i have a paragraph mm -hmm paragraph and corresponding to this complete paragraph i have this paragraphs uh, french uh, translation okay so my question is that it it looks at alphabet alpha by alphabet by what is the unit like it goes by alphabet by alphabet or by word by word okay so, so there are two things to consider when we are working with this problem okay see when we are going by alphabet by alphabet one thing that we have under control is that the number of alphabets okay so number of alphabets are limited but when we go by word by word the number of words can be completely uh, of large so let's say in the final layer so uh, so let's say in this layer, the final layer here, here I'm having one hot encoding system, which is a classifier. So let's say I want to classify which French word I want there, but we know that we have seen an English dictionary, how big, so a French dictionary will also be that big. So we cannot have a classifier of one lakh uh, uh, words here, but it's easier to have a classifier of uh, some 26 alphabets. okay so generally uh, what we supply to the model is a bag of words like that is based on some dictionary size 10000 yeah. 30000 so exactly. those are words not the not the alphabets basically yeah those are words not the alphabets okay uh, but again that number is very high 10000 30000 when i am working with alphabets uh, my final layer will only be 26 or if i uh, treat uh, capital and small and as well as uh, numbers as well and other things as well uh, a bit but not more than 100 or so right okay so that is the bonus that uh, so uh, so we can work with less memories but again working with words is uh, especially bag of words not even words but bag of words is way more highly efficient than working with alphabets but when we are working on a very small machine which has a limited rams we cannot work on words we cannot create that big one hot encoding vectors so that's why we have to work on alphabets okay uh Daksh? Uh, so, uh, like in word embeddings, like word level embeddings, uh, some meaning is captured in embeddings, right? So, yeah. what kind of uh, information is captured in character level embeddings? Yeah, again, so some characters again come together a lot. Like if is a word that's very frequent in the whole uh, my corpus. Okay, so there will be a very I and F. So they, the embeddings of I and F will be very close to each other because if there's an I, there's a very good chance the next that I can be an F. 
is a very good chance but uh, there might be some combination of letters that are very unfrequent like yz now why why and z cannot you won't see y and z that easily together in the whole corpus so the embedding of y and z can be really far off from each other so again it will capture that which two characters frequently come close to each other which two characters are not seen close to each other oh uh, yeah okay thanks Yeah, so coming back to my data set, yes, so basically, yes, this data set has some simple ones as well for some words, but again, it's not for all of the words. It's for very common words, more like the words that are used as phrases, like uh, it's not for every word in the dictionary. It's for words that use as phrases like go, hi, run. So these are the words, relax. So it's a sentence, relax, that's it. And similarly, be calm. So these are phrases, not exactly every word. Word. So uh, it's also important to know that initially they're just uh, very small phrases translated. Okay, I don't have one-to-one -one translation for each word, but I have one-to-one -one translation for one lakh ninety thousand sentences, in which each sentence can be of very varied length. So a sentence can be of just a single word as well. Like really, within a question mark and a sentence can be as complex as the talisman he's wearing is supposed to ward off evil spirits. So I have a complex sentence as well of varying length. So I've, I need to take care of each of these aspects, aspects as well. Okay, so this is just the code that we are having. So here we are just downloading the data set. Uh, just we are importing some stuff. Okay, and so here we can see we are specifying the batch size. We are specifying the epochs. Uh, I will just zoom a bit. Uh, it's visible, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then I will specify a latent dimension. By latent dimension, I mean that what will be the embedding size, what will be the size of the LSTM state and those things, okay. Then I'm also mentioning some number of samples. Of course, uh, two lakh samples are a very large to train for my laptop. So I won't be, tra I haven't trained on two lakh samples. I've only trained on 10,000 uh, samples, okay. And then uh, this is the data part where the data is provided. So here, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, initializing some empty lists. So these lists will create my input and target text and input characters and target characters is a set. Set will act as the dictionary of characters. So this will act as a dictionary of characters. Okay. So that I can assign one word to an integer. I will just very briefly go what I'm doing, not exactly how I'm doing because I don't want to waste much time. If we get time, I will come back to it. Okay, so here I'm just dividing the data set in lines because each line is one data point. Okay, here I'm just saying that I only take uh, uh, the last 10,000 samples. Okay, the reason I'm taking the last 10,000 samples are because those are the complex ones. So I can easily show that even on complex samples, it works. I'm not taking the easy first 1,000 samples. Okay, then here what I'm doing is I'm creating, uh, so, so here I'm just going through the data set and understanding what the data set is. Okay, and I'm also adding two more tokens. So the first token is backslash T. Uh, yeah, uh, Nafsheed, I will do that. Uh, I will come to it, why I haven't done it and why I, it, this will be available by you till tomorrow. Okay, uh, this collapse. Yeah, so I'm also adding two tokens. See, because uh, this, uh, 
we have no idea that how long our data could be, the French data can be. We have no idea how long that can be, okay, when we are translating. So that's why we need two extra tokens. So I'm adding two tokens. One is backslash D, I'm adding this token as a start token, and one is new line character, I'm adding this as a end sequence token, token that the sequence has ended. And so I'm also adding two tokens which tell the system that this is the start token and this is the end sequence token that after this, the sequence is complete. Okay, so on every target text, I'm first appending the start token and I'm, so, so not appending, uh, repenting the start token and appending the end of line token. Now every target te text starts with a start token and ends with an end token, okay. Okay, so let's say the text was bonjour. Now it will be backslash T, bonjour, backslash N, where these will be start and uh, this is my, sorry, this is my start token. This is my end token, okay. Yeah, now here what I'm doing, I'm actually creating what I can say uh, the dictionary. So I'm reading all the input text and I'm creating a, a input dictionary and I'm reading all the target text and I'm creating the target dictionary. Okay, then I am sorting both the dictionaries. Right, so I'm adding, uh, so now I'm creating that how many number of uh, tokens or how many number of characters I'm having. So I'm taking length of this dictionary plus one because there will one extra character that will be a pad character because I need to pad all of this as well. Okay, so, so because of that pad character, the number of vocabulary, the vocabulary size has also increased. Uh, yes, Kushal. Hello, Kushal. Uh, hello, sir. This accidentally it happened. I was not oh, okay. Resuming. Okay. And similarly for decoder, uh, I'm taking that how many number of samples are there and then I'm adding one pad character. Okay. And then I'm also calculating the maximum sequence length because I will be padding each sequence length to the maximum sequence length there is. And then I'm printing all of this that uh, total number of samples are 10,000. I have 80 unique tokens in English, 100 unique tokens in French. The reason this number is so high is because uh, first of all, I'm having all the alphabets in lowercase, all the alphabets in uppercase, then I'm having the numericals as well, then uh, question marks, full stop, exclamation point, point, all of these things as well, hyphens. So all of these characters that are used in English language, all of these characters as well. Okay, similarly, whenever all of these characters are used in French, all of such characters as well. And maximum sequence for my English is 286 and from my French is 351. Now I'm actually creating a dictionary. Okay, so basically, so uh, I, I don't want to go into uh, just uh, much in depth of what a Python dictionary is, but you can say Python dictionary, uh, it's like a normal dictionary. So let's say given any character, I want to find out its integer value, I can create a dictionary for that. So inside that dictionary, if I give that character, I will get its integer value. Inside a dictionary, I will give some other character, I will get its integer value. And inside a dictionary, I give some other character, I will get its integer value. So what I'm doing is, so for all the characters, uh, I'm uh, using enumerate function, I'm providing unique integer to all the characters for English, and I'm providing a unique integer to all the characters from French. Okay, so I'm creating two dictionaries. Uh, one is for English, which creates a unique number, except zero. I'm not giving the number zero to anybody. That's why I'm using I plus one here, because whenever you're using for loop, I goes from zero, except zero, all the other numbers, okay, that are going to be there. Uh, I'm providing one integer number to each of the characters in English and one integer number to each of the characters in French. Can anybody tell me why I am not uh, assigning zero to any character? It's null, is it, uh, for both of it? Uh, it may be uh, reserved for the start of sentence. Is it so? Uh, uh, that no, maybe if you're using one-hot notation. 
Yeah. yeah, if case we are using one hot notation, then zero will be used there. Yeah, I mean, zero can be the zero class can be the when the very first value is I can start the one hot notation from zero class. That's not a big deal. See, yeah, so the, one of the guys almost said partially correct answer. It's actually reserved for one of a very special tokens, not for start, because the start token has already been added to the my corpus. Okay, so the dictionary has the start token and then start token has already been given. So I can show, yes, so start token has already been given an integer value. Okay, I so have this, so one answer? I'm preserving, yeah, padding. Okay, okay. So, okay. so padding is the one for which I have reserved the zero. What the reason uh, always reserve a zero for padding, especially in an NLP. Uh, I will come to it later on. Okay, but always reserve zero for padding. So this is where I'm creating the dictionary for pad that I'm adding. Uh, so this is something that I'm doing on my own. Okay. Now I'm creating the uh, input yeah. for- Just yeah. one question, uh, why we are not converting or upper cases to lower case because it won't change the meaning now. We are again using no. upper cases as well as a separate. So, so we are, uh, we are uh, taking care of the case that uh, many languages, upper cases and lower case, they like uh, inside the sentence, whenever there's a name, it should start with an upper case. Okay. Okay. Whenever there's an I as in the only I as a word, it should be uppercase, but I uh, internal of any word should be lower. So we are taking care of those rules as well of a language. Okay. Yeah. So now here we are creating an encoder input. Okay. So the encoder input size will be Okay, uh, number of samples that is 10,000. Okay, comma, max encoder sequence length that was 286. Okay, so what I'm saying is I have 10,000 English sentences and each sentence has a sequence length of 286 and 286 values. Okay, that's Similarly for decoder, I'm also going to create 10,000 French sentences and each sentence will be of 351 length. So what I'm saying is that for French, again, I have 10,000 sentences and each sentence will be of 351 uh, sequence length. Okay. But we can see that there is a bit of change in the uh, shape of my target data. Okay, target data is the output of the decoder. So the output of the decoder is of the shape 10,000 comma 351 comma uh, 103. Okay, comma 103. So what it's saying is that I have 10,000 uh, sentences in French. Each sentence is 351 sequence length, but now each sentence is in one hot encoded vector because so this will be used as the label as the ground truth uh, for my decoder for the training of the whole system and since we are treating it as a classification problem uh, each of the character now will be converted into ground truth in this case okay so here i'm just populating these uh, uh, arrays but uh, i'm not going to go into detail of this code but all i just want to show is that i've created three arrays one is the encoder input, that is my English language. One is the decoder input, that is my French language. And one is my decoder target, that is my French language in one hot encoding vector. vector. But it's also important to note that uh, this thing is right shifted so that as I've shown previously that when I will give start token, it has to give B correspondingly. When I give B, it has to give O. So this thing is right shifted. So one right shifted. Okay, so this is my data, right? So now coming to how to create such models. Okay, so here it's something, I mean, uh, different than what you have previously seen. And uh, 
Okay, so now I want to create an encoder model. Okay, now what is the input to an encoder model? The input to an encoder model is 10,000 comma 286. That is, uh, Basically, let's this be batch size. Okay, uh, the in, so at a point, the encoder will get a batch of sentences where each sentence will be of 286 dimensional and uh, each value will be an integer type value. Okay, so because for each character, I am having a specified integer. So that will be an input to the encoder. So that's the input to the encoder. So over this input, the very first thing that I want to create is an embedding layer. Okay, so, uh, Keras again, uh, TensorFlow Keras gives inside an embedding layer. Okay, so uh, we can see the parameters of this embedding layer. The first parameter is embedding dimension. The second parameter is number of encoder tokens. And the third is mask zero. Okay, now I'm going through each of these parameters, what this embedding layer does. So what this embedding layer will do is it will actually create a fully connected network. Okay, it will create a fully connected network. So what it will do is it will have a two step process. Oh, sorry for that. It will have a two step process. The first step will be, see, now the input is in the form of integer, right? That is a one dimensional. Okay, it will, the very first step will be, it will convert this to one hot encoding. Okay, now to convert this to one hot encoding, it must know that what is the what is the different values these integers are having. Otherwise, it cannot convert to one hot encoding. It should know that what uh, what are the different values. So that is, it should know that how many different tokens are there. So that's why we have provided number of encoder tokens to tell it that there are uh, one G uh, ninety six tokens. Okay, so this one hot encoding vector will be ninety six dimensional. So it will first convert the integer values into one hot encoding values. So my input will be now batch size comma. 286, sorry for that. Batches comma 286 comma 96. So from batches comma 286, it has converted the input to batches comma 286 comma 96, okay. Once it does that, it will now have a fully connected network, okay, that will convert this into batch size comma 286 comma embedding dimension. So the dimension that was provided here. So what it will do is now it will just learn a fully connected network between 96 cross embedding dimension. That's it. It will learn a fully connected network that will uh, that has an input of 96 and output of embedding dimension. And then it will apply this fully connected network over each character. So just one fully connected network, which converts each character into its corresponding embedding. And then it applies this one fully connected network over each of the characters uh, independently, uh, completely independently. So it's like a convolution layer, which is striding over the whole image. So it's a fully connected la layer, which is striding over the whole sequence. Okay, so that is what the embedding layer is. It first converts my input into one hot encoding and then it applies a fully connected layer between the one hot encoded vector to convert it into embedding dimension. And it will apply that layer over each character on each character, like a convolutional filter striding over each character. So this is everything that this embedding layer would be doing. And uh, this fully connected network is trainable. So it will train in such a way that it will actually learn that what is the relation, it will train according to the final task that we are having. So this embedding will be trained with the loss that's been back propagated because of the final task. Task. So we are not using any pre-trained embedding like word to vec we are actually training an embedding system which is specifically for this task. task. So finally, after this embedding layer, so if I apply this embedding layer, okay. So the output will be batch size comma, uh, sequence length comma, embedding dimension. So this will be the output after applying the embedding layer. So once I have applied the embedding layer, I will apply my final LSTM, okay. So now how I'm doing, doing this is, so how the, all of this is done in subclassing uh, model is that 
uh, that I want to create my own model, okay, with my own layers, right? But I want to make sure that all the properties of the actual model, uh, that the model can be compiled, the model can be trained, the model can we have saved, all of those properties are inherited. So that's why what we are doing is we are creating a class, we are creating a class encoder and inheriting the class model. Model. So what we are doing is, so I'm creating a new class, but this class is a child of the actual model class of the TensorFlow. Okay, so TensorFlow has a model class, I'm creating a child of that class. So inside this child, whatever function I write will be my function, whatever function I don't write will be model class function. So this model class has a lot of functions, let's say 50 functions, I'm only writing two functions. So if I let's say I have written a call function. Okay, so if I call this call function of encoder class, then this thing will run. But if I call some other function like get weights, save weights or compile or fit, then uh, for encoder itself, then uh, those functions which were defined in the model class, those will run. So using inheritance, I can actually uh, get all the properties of the parent class that I'm having. So this is just how we use inheritance in Python. So I'm inheriting the model class uh, in my child class encoder. Then first of all, I'm creating an initializer. Okay, initializer self is the object that the object I will be passing and then some parameters. The parameters will be embedding dimension because for the embedding network and number of encoder tokens again for the embedding. Okay. Then, so now I'm defining my own initializer, but first I need to call the initializer of the uh, tf.keras.model class so as I can get all the variables, uh, all the variables of the uh, super class, okay, uh, of the parent class. So first I'm calling the initializer of the parent class. Okay, and then I'm giving my own initializers. So whatever layers that we want to use, uh, inside our model, all of those layers have to be initialized. Yeah, Indian, as I already said here that I will share these collab links, but these collab links will be shared tomorrow. Okay, I will come to it why these will be shared tomorrow. Okay. So now, so for very first thing is whatever the layers that I want to use, I will first define each layer in my initialization. So I want to use an embedding layer and I want to use an LSTM layer. So I'm defining the embedding layer and LSTM layer in my initialization. And then finally I have call. So in call, there are three, fun three uh, arguments. The first argument is self. Uh, this is a, uh, this is for the, for the tracking of which object I'm working with. Then is the input that what will be the input to the model. Then is a variable training is equal to true or not. Okay, uh, training, whether I'm in training mode or I'm in testing mode. Okay, so very first thing that I'm doing is, so inside the call, so here I just uh, said that I'm going to use an embedding layer. I'm going to use an LSTM layer. Now here inside the call, I'm going to say that how I'm going to use them. So here I'm saying is that given the input, so this is my input, pass this input to the embedding layer. Okay, so once I pass this input to the embedding layer, I will get the encoder embeddings. Those will be of the size batches, comma, sequence length, comma, embedding dimension. Okay, now once I've gone, got the encoder embeddings, now I want to pass it them to the LSTM layer. Now LSTM layer, you can see that this is my LSTM. Okay, so this LSTM layer, I'm providing a few uh, parameters, but I actually, which would be better if I show, uh, sorry, the whole documentation of LSTM layer. Yeah, so this is my LSTM layer. Okay, LSTM layer has a lot of uh, properties that I can pass. The first property is units. That is what will be the size of my output and uh, hidden dimensions. Okay, so very first property is units. Second is activation. The default activation is 10H. Then some recurrent activations and so on. But 
it's important to know that in LSTM, I'm going to show very the very important ones that we will, will you have to use. First of all, you, you see these two dropout and recurrent dropout. Okay. So if you want to implement a dropout in an LSTM layer, you cannot just add dropout after the LSTM layer like we do it for dense layers. Okay. If you want to use dropout in LSTM layers, you need to provide within the layer itself that you want to use dropout and recurrent dropout. So if let's say you have very small data and you're using a lot of LSTM layers, then it's good to provide dropouts around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 and recurrent dropout as well of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Then another parameter that's very important is return sequence. Now return sequence tells whether the LSTM will just return the output of the last time step or it will return the output of all the time steps. Okay, so by default return sequences is false. That is it will only return the output of the last time step and it won't return the output of all of the time steps. But let's say in decoder, we will be using the uh, outputs of all of the timestamps. So hence in decoder, we will have return sequences is equal to false. Okay. Then the next important one is return state is equal to false. Now return state says that whether this LSTM will return the final state of the LSTM, that is the final values of H and C. So LSTM has two states, H and C. So whether it will return those two final values or not. So by default, it's false, but in the case of encoder, we specifically need those H and C values. That's why we are going to mark them as true. So here we can see that here when I'm creating this LSTM model, sorry, where does it? Oh, sorry for that. Here when I'm creating the LSTM model, I'm first giving the units that is the embedding dimension that is what will be the size of the state. And then I'm saying that return state is equal to true. That is, I need the states from you as well. So hence from the encoder embeddings, when once I'm uh, calling the LSTM layer using the encoder embeddings, so I'm getting three values, okay. The first value is encoder output. That is the output at the last time step. Then I'm getting the H state value and then I'm getting the C state value because my return state is true. If my return state was false, LSTM would have just given me encoder output, okay. That's it. And the sh what are the shapes of these? Okay. See the shape of encoder output will be batch size comma embedding dimension. Okay. And shape of both the states will be batch size comma embedding dimension. So that will be the shape of both the states. Okay, because see, state does not have the recurrent, uh, state is not recurrent. We are just getting the state after the final uh, time step. Okay, so that's why state does not have any recurrent information in that. Uh, sorry, recurrent variable in that. Okay, and similarly, since by default, the return sequence was false, we are only getting the output after the uh, final time step. You're not getting all the previous outputs. So we are just creating a list of the states to create one list encoder states and we are defining the output of the model using the return function. So return function defines that this model will output the encoder output and the encoder states we are having. So this is a way how to create a model, okay, using the subclassing. The model has one input that is English text. This input is passed to the embedding layer, then to LSTM. And then this model outputs two things. That is the encoder output as well as state output, the states of the network. The reason we have to use this in this way is because of this, the encoder states. Because encoder states, we cannot get encoder states when we are defining the layers. So when we are working with sequential and functional API, everything that we are getting, we are getting at the time of defining the layers, okay? But we actually get get these values when we say that you have, uh, you go to them, okay? You take a tensor, you take an input tensor and you go to them, then we will get these values. So that's why we now have to separate these two steps. That is the first step is initializing the layers. And finally, I'm going to specify how to use these layers. And here I can specify in any way I want to use these layers till the time I have initialized them. So this is a very simple encoder, which takes my English language, has an embedding layer over it, and then has LSTM. And then finally outputs me the uh, final time step and the states of the LSTM, this encoder state.
Now comes to the decoder model. Decoder model is a bit complex because the decoder model has two inputs. One input is the French text and the other input is the encoder state. Okay, so I'm having two inputs. So very first thing that I'm going to do is again, for the French test, I'm going to create an embedding layer. So I've created an embedding layer for the French text. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to inform about the embedding layer, mask zero is equal to true. So when we are cre creating embedding layers, right? Okay, so there's this value called mask zero is equal to true. So what are we saying here is that Wherever in the input, the value is zero, mask that whole value. That value is uh, unnecessary for us. So by just providing mask zero is equal to true, we are just saying that input wherever the value was zero, mask that whole temporal dimension. I don't want anything to do with that temporal dimension. So by providing uh, the value of zero to the padding token and in the embedding layer specifying mask zero is equal to true, I'm actually masking all of the dimension. Mm. Uh, padded dimensions, no loss will be computed, no, uh, nothing will happen for the padded dimensions. Masking is happening on its own. Similarly for French as well, I'm doing mask zero is equal to true. So uh, true. So I'm getting the French text and passing it to embedding layer. Okay. Now you see the decoder LSTM. Now decoder LSTM has returned sequences is equal to true as well and return state is equal to two as well, okay? So why decoder LSTM has return sequence equal to true? Because we need output for each sequence, uh, each time step. So decoder needs to provide output at each time step. That's why return sequence is equal to true and return state also is equal to true. And then we have final dense layer that is my classification layer, okay? So first I will pass the French, so the text input, that's my French to the embedding layer. Okay, now I'm passing two, two things to my LSTM layer. The very first thing is my French embeddings. And the second thing is the state input that I got from the encoder. Okay, so I will also pass the, uh, so, so this state input is the in encoder state, the one I got from the encoder, the encoder states. And I will pass the state input as the initial state of the decoder LSTM. So this is how I'm providing the encoder final state to as an initial state to the LSTM using uh, as passing it via initial state. And finally, I'm getting the decoder states as well and decoder outputs. Then I'm using a dense layer over the decoder outputs to get the final classification values. And then I'm returning the decoder output and decoder states. So now this is my decoder model which takes two inputs. One is the French text and one is the encoder state. Okay, it has, it applies embedding layer over the French text and then it applies LSTM over the French embeddings with initial state as the encoder output. And finally it outputs my decoder output and the final state of my decoder. Now I'm going to combine all of this together. Okay, so I'm having two inputs, encoder input and decoder input. Okay, so two text, encoder text and decoder text as my input. Okay, so I'm passing the encoder text to my encoder. I'm getting the encoder output and encoder state output. Okay, then I'm passing the decoder text and the encoder state output to the decoder. Okay, I'm ignoring the encoder output completely. I'm just passing decoder text and decoder state output to the decoder. And then I'm finally getting the decoder output. And again, I'm ignoring the uh, decoder states. And then I'm finally outputting decoder output. So now this is my complete training model, which will get two text, the English text and the French text uh for training the whole text and it will output the decoded output the output of the decoder uh for computing the loss purposes so any doubts till now uh, where are we getting self dot encoder and self dot decoder from okay yeah so for creating the training model, I will pass the encoder model and decoder model to this class. Okay. Okay, yeah, I will come back to it later on. So what I'm doing is I'm first creating an object of encoder model. 
then I'm creating an object of decoder model and I'm passing the encoder model and the decoder model to the training model. Yeah, got it. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, any other doubts? Okay, so I can move forward. One thing is important to know that there's another thing that I could have done here. What if, if I don't pass these encoder and decoder models? Can I do it without passing these encoder and decoder models to training model? Some alternative here. Anyone? You could have defined it then and there itself. Yes, I could have defined that Minda. I could have called the encoder class here itself. I could have done this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't I do? I know it's a very difficult question. It's so, so basic. Think, uh, yeah, the parameters uh, you need to pass into training model, all the parameters that encoder and decoder classes take, which becomes like when the argument list. Ah, uh, so that's a coding aspect more of mm -hmm. it, but no, it's not for coding aspect, code is it. It's not for that. Okay. See, as I initially told, so the testing system, the testing model is completely different, right? So I will be creating another testing model. Okay. But let's say that if I had defined, if I had created an object of encoder model here, Okay, I would have to return this encoder model object as well so that I could use this encoder model object some other time. By creating an encoder model outside of any class, what I have done is that now I can use this encoder and decoder models somewhere else as well. Not just in my training model, but in some other fashion for testing as well. And this is something very wonderful about TensorFlow is since this training model is actually made from one object of encoder and decoder model. So if I train this final model, it will automatically train encoder and decoder models as well. Okay, it will share the weights between. So this is called weight sharing. The reason I want to cover is this is called weight sharing that, that despite these seem like three different models, that there's an encoder model, there's a decoder model, and then there's a final model, but the encoder weights between encoder model and model are shared, and the decoder weights between decoder model and model are shared. So since I want these weights to be shared, so that once, if I train model, my encoder and decoder model is also trained. So rather than creating weights inside my uh, class, class, I'm not creating weights inside the class. See, because it's important to note when are weights being created. So if I see at the encoder network, where are the weights? The weights will be created when I call the embedding layer, when I call the LSTM layer, okay? That's when the weights are being created, right? These are being created in the initializer. So they will be created once when I, create an object of a of that class. So once I have created the object of encoder model, it will create the weights. So if I use this object of encoder model anywhere, the same weights will be used all of the there. It won't use different weights. So this is one flexibility of weight sharing that can be done using uh, such systems that I can actually perform weight sharing this way. 
because again, I have differentiated the weights initialization part to how I am actually defining my model. So both the parts have been differentiated. So I can now share the weights. So this is where, so by this concept has come before, uh, using this concept itself, we can also create Siamese networks. Because again, in Siamese based networks, we need weight sharing, weight sharing as well. So we utilize this weight sharing in Siamese networks as well. So that's why uh, we have created these models in such a way because uh, I want to use this encoder and decoder models for testing in some other way, which is not defined by this model. Okay, I can do that. Uh, I can actually pass the weights of this encoder and decoder model and create my model. And if I train this model, my encoder and decoder models will also get trained because of the weight sharing. So that's why it has been, that's why the initializations and the callings have been broken off. We are not using functional APIs. We are actually using uh, subclassing API for creating models. So the reason uh, I'll learn to create models this way because you can have so much, you can also create very simple models this way. Like this is a very simple encoder. It just takes an input, applies an embedding layer, applies an LSTM layer, gives me an output. That's it. You can create a simple model as well this way, but you can also create complex models which have multiple utilities as well. So it's actually good to learn how to create models this way, not go for that model.add, model.add. So finally, I'm compiling the model using optimizer and my loss. Again, I had didn't provide any activation function. So I'm using from legends true. And then I'm training the model on the encoder data and the decoder data and my decoder targets. Okay, so this is the model training. Okay, so we have trained the model for 100 epochs. Now, finally, I want to get some uh, targets from that model. Okay, so what my trained model gave is uh, as an output. So let's say now I gave a new English sentence to it. Okay, so what will be the output, right? So for that, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a reverse dictionary. That is since because now uh, the model will output me some French words. Okay, the decoder will output me some French words in the form of integers. Now I need to convert these integers to characters. So that's why I, I am using a reverse dictionary that given any integer, it will give its corresponding character. Okay, and here I am finally iterating one by one uh, over the decoder model. Okay, so now you can see here. So this is the part where I'm decoding a sequence. So given any sequence, I'm first using encoder model dot predict. So I'm putting the sequence and I'm putting it to the encoder model as it is. So I'm taking an English language. I'm putting it to encoder model. This will give me the states value. Okay, now I've gotten the states value. Now encoder model is useless for me. So now I've got all the information about the English language I need. Now the encoder model is useless for me. So now what I will be doing is that I, inside a loop, I will be just using the decoder model dot predict and providing the states values. So I will be just one by one, one uh, character at a time, time, uh, I will be iterating over the decoder model and predicting one character. So First time using predict, it will predict my first character. Then it will predict my second character. Then it will predict my third character and so on. And finally, I will get the whole sentence. So here are some examples. The input sentence was, it will probably take you about three hours to do that. And this was a decoded sentence that came uh, from the decoder. Uh, decoder. So this is how we create such sequence to sequence models. Uh, using an LSTM based architecture. Okay. I, I know I've not gone to in details of many of the aspects because I want to cover transformers as well. If I go into details of every of these uh, things, how everything is happening, uh, we won't be able to cover transformers actually. So that's one of the issues. That's why I'm going uh, this fast. But I hope it's clear how to create one sequence to sequence model and to make sure that you can also use it for testing as well 
and uh, it's no, not just left for training the systems. Okay, so shall we move to transformers or are there any uh, or you need a break or maybe for uh, five uh, minutes we can have Okay, yeah, let's then have a five minutes break and then we will come back to Transformers. Okay. Yeah. So we will meet at uh, four, five, uh, eight minutes break. Uh, yeah yeah so this is the uh, architecture from the paper the attention is all you need okay so they termed it as the transformer uh, and uh, so it has two systems the encoder and the decoder uh, it's a bit simpler in the sense that it does not have the systems like uh, uh, the states of an lstm LSTM, but it's also complex in the way that there are multiple inputs inside this decoder. I mean, I'm not saying that this input decoder is going as an input or is going somewhere else, but somewhere inside the network, very specifically at inside the network. Okay. Okay. So again, if you were trying to do this thing with sequential model of functional API, you cannot do it because of this connection mainly because see, this this connection okay this connection would actually restrict it but it's very simply done using the subclassing okay but i'm just going to give you so this is my english i will convert into embedding layer then i will add the position embedding then i will apply an mha and then a residual connection and layer norm and then a feed forward network and residual connection and layer norm. Feed forward network is nothing but two dense layers uh, uh, with ReLU activation. So this is the only part in the whole system where there's non-linearity actually. So that's why uh, it's required. And then finally in decoder, I will have the outputs that is shifted, right? Okay, right shifted. And uh, that is my French language, then embedding layer for French, then positional encoding, then an internal MHA uh, attention head followed by addition and normalization. Then a, we call it, so this is the term that we use that is cross multi-head attention. Okay, so for differentiating it with other ones. Why cross? Because it's actually computing attention between French and English. Okay, so that's why we call it cross multi-head attention. Um, attention and then finally add a norm and then finally my feed forward network followed by a li linear and my class my classification layer so this is a architecture that we are going to uh code uh, code now uh, for again mm, english to french translation okay yeah the uh, initial story is all same so till here, because I'm working with the same data sets, so same pre-processing. So there's no problem with that. Okay. So first thing I'm going to create is my positional embedding layer. Uh, layer. So this is the very first layer. Despite in this image, we can see the positional embedding layer is very simple. That is just the position information inside. But we are going to do a lot of things inside this layer while coding. We are actually going to do three things in positional embedding layer. The first thing is uh, we will also have the input embedding layer uh, inside this itself. We will also have the positional encoding inside this as well. And we will also compute the masks that uh, 
the padding masks inside this as well. So all the three things will be done inside here itself. So that uh, that is the embedding layer, positional encoding and computing the padding mask. Okay. So that's why we are first creating a layer that will do all of these three things. Okay. Uh, so, right. So again, the reason I want to show you this is that we can actually create our own layers as well uh, in Keras. It's not just we can use their own layers, but we can create our own layer as well. And here we are going to create our completely new layer that is a positional embedding layer, which can do three things. Uh, convert the text into embeddings. Okay and uh, add the positional encoding to it and then also compute the mask based on the information that the padded uh, in inputs will be going to be zeros so all the three things are going to be done in this layer okay so for doing this again as it was a similar with model when i want to create my own layer i have to utilize their parent class the layer class class okay and i have to call inherit this layer class. So I'm creating my positional embedding layer by inheriting that layer class, okay? Then I'm defining the initializer for my own layer, but first I'm calling the initializer of the parent class, okay? So that is the initializer that I'm calling. Now I'm initializing my positional embedding layer. So in initializing, first now I'm going to define what will be the trainable aspects and some variables that are going to be used. Okay, so first of all, I'm having an embedding layer. So this embedding layer will actually convert the characters to the embeddings as we had the embedding layer previously. Finally, we will also have a position embedding layer because see the position vectors are going to be integer vectors. So we are going to convert those position vectors as well to an uh, embedding, uh, embedding. So we have a positional embedding layer as well and some uh, uh, variables which are going to be used in this class that is sequence length, vocab size, embedding size. So similarly, as in the previous, while creating a model, we have to define our call function while creating our own class. Okay. And in the call function, we actually define what happens when any data comes inside this layer. So whenever an input is coming into this layer, we are first computing what is the sequence length of this input. Okay, so it's important to note that the input that is coming is of the size batch size comma sequence length, similar to the input that was coming previously. Okay, so if I'm computing the shape of this input and seeing the last shape that will give me the sequence length. So I'm getting the sequence length of my input. Okay, then for this sequence length, I'm using the range function to create uh, the positional values. Okay, so let's say the sequence length so, was 60. So, sorry, uh, what is the length in this case? We have just written length. What is the length? The sequence length. Yeah, and any number, any... Yeah, numeric... so that's the point. So whatever the sequence length of the, any input that is passed, it will compute that. Okay, okay, got it, got it, thanks. So you can pass input of any sequence length. It doesn't matter. Got it, thank you. Okay. Let's say you pass the sequence length of 16. So let's say now, now the length is 16. So now I'm going to create the position in teachers. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm using the function range. Now range will actually create a range of numbers which will start from start. It will go till the limit and it will jump by Delta. So here, what I'm saying is start from zero, go till the length and jump by one. So what it will do is it will create 16 num. So it will start from zero. So the first number will be zero. Then it will jump by Delta. So Delta is one. The second number will be one. The third number will be two and so on. So once it come to 15, okay. After 15, the Delta is one. Okay. And then the, my limit was 16. So it won't go to 16. So it excludes the limit. So it will create the numbers, numbers based on the Delta from start to the limit, excluding the limit. So from starting from zero 
it has created number still 15 so that is 16 numbers so it has created uh, my positions for my sequence length for my 16 uh, sequences it has computed positions positions okay uh, did sir cover the positional encoding used in the paper no 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 no, no. Okay, actually in paper, they are uh, having a completely different positional encoding. Where is that? Yeah. Yeah, in paper, they are actually having a completely different positional encoding. This is called a sinusoidal positional encoding. Okay, uh, I will also share the code for the sinusoidal positional encoding. So this is one of the reasons that I am not sharing the collab links right now because I want to add the code for sinusoidal positional encoding as well. And I was not able to get it working in time. Time And because of that, trying to work it, my current transformer code is also not working because I changed so many things that I'm not able to track back all the changes as well for normal positional encoding. But currently what we are seeing our code is with very simple positional encoding that the first element will be position zero, the second element will be position one, the third element will be position two, and so on the 16th element will be position 15. A very simple integer based positional encoding we are created in this case, but in the paper they actually created a sinusoidal. And uh, so once I, ha I have uh, created a whole transformer system with sinusoidal positional encoding as well, I will share it with all of you. Okay, so basically, so these, these are the positions that I'm creating. Okay, now finally, I have to also compute the mask. So I have defined my own function that is compute mask, which will compute the mask from the input. Okay, this is a very simple function that is that wherever, so not equal, not equal is a function that will return me uh zero when the two entities so that will return me one when the two entities are not equal if they are equal it will return me zero so whenever there's a zero in the input it will actually return me zero because they are actually equal and it's a not equal function it's opposite of equal function and all the other areas it will return one so it has actually created a mask in which wherever the values in the input was non-zero, I will have one. And wherever the values of the input are zero, I will get a zero there. So this is a very simple way of creating your own mask. mask. So once you know what is the embedding of the padding. In this case, you can have any integer for padding. You can have one, two, three, four, minus 100, minus 200. It's your choice because we are creating our own mask. But whatever the integer we use for padding we need to put this integer here so now we have created a mask as well okay that's my encoder mask so now i'm passing my input that is my text to my token embeddings okay now the text was integer right now the integer has been converted to embeddings now the positions are also integers now i want to convert positions also into the embeddings so which i have done this by passing the positions to position embedding and then finally i am adding my uh, text embedding and my position embedding and I'm returning them as the output of this layer and I'm also returning the mask uh, as the output of this layer. See, there's a reason why I had to compute the mask here itself is because after this layer, I don't have, so the data, the integer data has been converted to embeddings. Now I don't know that which were the portions that were actually padded. Hence, I had to compute mask before um, uh, before converting the input to the embeddings. So because so if I have converted the input to the embeddings here, so if I've converted the input embeddings after that, uh, the padding zero is no longer zero, it's a vector. And I don't know which vector is the padding vector. Okay, so that's why I cannot compute which ones, what's the mask. So that's why I have to do it before only. So that's why one layer I've created, which does three things that is, computes the embeddings, uh, computes the positional embeddings, and it computes the mask. Okay. So the very first steps have been done. So these are the steps that have been done by my positional layer there. So now I'm going to create the encoder model. That is this complete model I'm having. 
So this is my full encoder model. I'm going to create this. So the very first thing in the encoder model is the positional layer, right? So in the initializer of the encoder model, I'm first calling the positional embedding layer. Now the positional embedding layer is like calling any other layer, multi-head attention dense layer, but I'm, this is the layer that we have our own created. So this is how easy it is to create your own layer as well. So that's how you basically create your own layer. So we will first call the position embedding layer. Then we will call one MHA layer. So we have called a multi-head attention. Now Keras has actually provided us a multi-head attention layer. Okay. Uh, and it has given many different parameters, just like LSTM, it has very different parameters. And I would advise you to go on its documentation and see which are the parameters that work, but what are the major parameters that we need are the number of heads in multi-head that how many number of heads are there and the dimensions that what will be the dimensions of the key, key dimensions. That is uh, what will be the dimensions of key query and values after applying the uh, W matrices. So if I reiterate, so MHA was actually, wait, is that? Yeah, uh, WQWK WV. So MHA was actually having three weight matrices before applying the uh, uh, self dot product, the attention dot product. So what will be the output of these fully connected layers? So that's my key dimension. What will be the output of the fully connected layers? And then I'm defining my uh, feed forward network. Feed forward network is nothing but two dense layers. So I'm using a sequential network to create a feed forward network. Uh, in the sequential network, I am calling one dense layer with an activation layer followed by another dense layer. That's it. So this is my feed forward network or here I'm calling it as dense. And then I'm initializing a couple of layer, layer knobs. So this is we my- We don't call. need an activation for the second dense layer. Sorry. Uh... Uh, no, 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 no. That's not right. basically how they have defined in the architecture. So we are just creating their own architecture here. Okay. They're creating their own architecture. So there's a reason why they had, there's no activation. See, because, uh, so in the end, what we are getting here is we are getting outputs based on uh, dot products, right? Now the property of dot products is that dot product can be from range of minus infinity to infinity. So hence, because of that, the output can be ranged from anywhere between minus infinity to infinity after weighing it by a dot product. That is my final multiplication. Okay. But after the first trailer, the range will change from zero to infinity. Yeah, the range will change from zero to infinity. That's true. But why we are doing that is see, uh, actually, you can see that we are actually applying n times this thing, right? Here I've coded just once, but in the paper they have said that this whole system. So after this add a norm, after feed forward network, and then again after add a norm, what would happen is this output will again go to the multi-head attention, attention, right? So the reason why this ReLU is there is because we at least need one uh, non-linearity in the system. Okay, uh, because without non-linearities, the system won't work. The whole system will be just a simple linear system and hence it won't work. The same theory that we saw in fully connected networks is true everywhere. So that's why we need non-linearities, but the whole system is made in such a way that it works with uh, ranges from minus infinity to infinity. So to have the best of both, huh, we are actually having feed forward network in such a way that the first dense layer will create that non-linearity, but then there will be another dense layer which will be free to project it into any uh, range as possible. Okay, thank you. And then finally, I'm initializing two layer norms, okay? Uh, because these are the two layer norms that will be used. So one thing is important to note, so while initializing, you don't have to care about the order in which you are initializing. You can initialize the layers in any order because here we are just initializing. We're not using these layers, but we're going to use them in call. Okay, so in call, the first thing is input. That is my English text. I'm passing it to a positional layer. So the positional layer will give me the X that is the embedding after positional encoding and my mask. Okay, uh, these are just some, uh, okay. Now, 
now see the mask was currently what one dimensional mask just telling that which sequence which of the sequences is actually going to be masked masked okay but the but see but inside the multi head attention it's important to know that inside this multi head attention when we will be doing the math multiplication between q and k okay so is that yeah q k transpose so this is the matrix multiplication between query and k now i'm going to tell you guys so what's happening inside actually okay let's say my query is batch size comma 100 the sequence length is 100 comma some d dimension 128 that is my d dimension okay we are going to ignore the batch size so my query is 100 comma 128 where 100 is the sequence length 128 is a embedding dimension okay my key is also let's say 100 comma 128 okay what will be the dimension after k into q transpose what will be the output dimension 100 100 into 100 perfect so this will be sequence length into sequence length okay and if i say in this 100 100 what is so this is a matrix of 100 100 how how will you define what is specified by one value in this 100 cross 100 matrix that is one i at comma j at value so if i pinpoint one i at comma j at value how will you say that what this value is i at key to the j at query response yeah so basically so how much uh, close or how much related or how much correlated i at key and j at query is okay right so now let's say my padding said my padding was just 100 dimensional vector okay but now it said that uh, in this 100 dimension vectors it said that my last 50 are padded okay let's say it was saying that my last 50 are padded so in this 100 cross 100 matrix how many values are going to be padded 100 into 50 15 to 50 okay yeah 15 my bad yeah why because if 50 keys and 50 queries right okay so all the dot products related to the last 50 keys should be padded should be masked and all the dot products related to the last 50 queries should be masked okay so now hence now that's why i need to convert this 100 into a matrix of 100 cross 100 okay i need to make it compatible with 100 cross 100 okay my mask needs to be compatible with that okay so for that what i will do is how many of you know about the concept of broadcasting you can raise your hands if you are familiar with the concept of broadcasting okay just one okay so what the concept of broadcast thing is not familiar yeah okay so what the concept of broadcasting is that let's say i will talk about numpy arrays okay let's say i have a numpy array of size 2 comma 2 i have a numpy array of size 2 comma 2 okay let's say the array is I will okay one 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 a very simple two comma two cross two array. Okay, so this is my numpy array that I am having. Okay, now I want to do an operation 
let's just be array a i want to mul multiply each value of this array to two by two okay so the operation that i want to do is element wise multiplication of each element of this array with two so what i need I would have to do two into a two into a but does it make sense we all know that two into a works but does it make sense i mean broadcasting says that it will multiply element by element each matrix into two no no that's not what broadcasting says so basically so we know about the multiplication one one rule of element wise multiplication is that we can only multiply those arrays which are of similar size that is given 2 comma 2 we can multiply it with 2 comma 2 okay let's say i give you an array 1 comma 3 and one array of 5 comma 7 will this is a and this is b will numpy a into b work no it won't work so why is a into b working when a is a 2 cross 2 array and b is just one value so why is A into B working here? Yeah, so B will basically be a two cross two matrix with element two. Yeah, so that is what broadcasting. It will convert that single element to, it will broadcast that single element two into a two cross two matrix on its own. So before multiplying, what it will do is, now B is basically just, oh, one comma matrix it's just a single scalar value it will convert this into a two cross two matrix and then it will a is also two cross two matrix b has also become a two cross two matrix then it will multiply a and b to give you the final output this is broadcasting that it so if whenever you are performing any element wise operation we're in two matrices okay and there's some multiplicative relation between the axes then it can broadcast. I can give you another example here. Another example can be A is a matrix of let's say size 2 comma 3. Wait, uh, 6 comma 3. B is a matrix of size 2 comma 9. Can I multiply these two matrices element wise? No. Oh. Yeah, they can be. A's row is a multiple, three time multiple of B's row. Yeah. And A's column is a three time, B's column is a three time multiple of A's column. Exactly. So, so while checking what it will do is it will see. So what is the first axis six? And what is the first axis two? Is there is a multiplicative? Can I repeat this axis in such a way that I can get this six? Yes, I can repeat this axis three times and I can get this value six. So yes, I can broadcast two into six. Now A has the second axis as three, B has the second axis as nine. Yes, I can repeat this three, three times to get nine, I can broadcast. So now what it will do is it will convert A to six comma nine. It will convert B to six comma nine. And finally it will multiply creating a C matrix of six comma nine. So this is broadcasting, broadcasting. So, uh, so whenever, so whenever uh, the axis is uh, of two matrices for which I'm going to perform an um, element wise operation, they are at a ratio, uh, integer ratio of each other, then they can be broadcasted. And yes, that the operation can be performed. This is a wonderful concept and this is something that you should practice, you should actually see because it's a very dangerous concept as well. Okay, it's a very dangerous concept. The danger lies in the fact that, um, let's say I create B is equal to one comma one. So I'm creating an array, okay. And A is equal to, one comma one what is the difference between these two b and a arrays 
is array of arrays. B has two columns. A has two rows, one column. Yes, B has two columns and one row. A has two rows and one column. Okay, so if I multiply A and B, ideally on its own, what it should do is it should just, if I let's say add, it should take care of it, right? It won't have two values. Okay, but one is in row major format, one is in column major format. So it will actually create a what it will do is it will do one comma one, sorry, addition, two comma two, two comma two. So it will broadcast B having two rows, two columns. It will broadcast A having two rows, two columns, and then it will add both of them. This is what it's going to do. So this is one of the problems in broadcasting is when uh, you don't know which axis you are working on. So what was the problem here is that, this is a very big problem with broadcasting. The problem was, the shape of B was two comma, and the shape of A was one comma two. But we assume that since there are only two values, since there are only two values in this, okay, we assume that both were like row major or column major. No, both were not. One was two comma one, one was one comma two. So that's why this is a very much problem when uh, we write some arrays in the sense of two comma, when we don't that much take care that what is the next dimensions or how many number of axes we are having. So one rule is that to make sure that the broadcasting is going correct, okay, you just convert the number of axes to the same. So let's say I have uh, one matrix of uh, size, batch size, comma, 100, comma, 100. So this is one matrix that I'm having. Okay, and I want to make sure that uh, 100 matrix gets broadcasted into this. So what I will do is I will add two new accesses. Two new axes, oh, sorry, I had batch size comma 100. I had a matrix batch size comma 100. So I want to make sure it broadcasts. Okay, so what I will make sure, I will make sure that the number of accesses in both of these are same. Okay, the ones that I need to broadcast, they are matched. So what I will do is I don't care about what, uh, it will take care of the broadcasting all its own, but I will convert this into batch size comma 100, sorry, one comma one comma 100. Because I need the 100 values, but I also need that it broadcasts these 100 values the one comma one matrix so that it creates a hundred cross hundred matrix. So that this one comma one and this hundred comma hundred can be broadcasted using these hundred values. Values. So if I convert batches comma hundred by adding new accesses at the middle part, the way the ones which I need to broadcast, I can broadcast any of the given uh, mask to the, uh, to the shape of the K into Q transpose that I'm having. And I don't have to take care whether it's broadcasting, it will automatically do that. So that is why we are adding two new accesses here. So inside the mask, we are adding two new access, access so that I can make them compatible for broadcasting so that they are actually ready to be broadcasted internally. So that's when I'm converting my mask to batches one comma one comma one comma hundred. It might seem counterintuitive why it's working, but uh, once you will experiment with uh, uh, broadcasting, you will understand that why it's working, working. Okay. Uh, why it works this way. Okay. So please go through and experiment with broadcasting a bit. Uh, and TensorFlow broadcasting follows the same rule as NumPy broadcasting. So you can experiment with NumPy broadcasting. It's a wonderful concept and you must be familiar with it, especially if working in data science. But anyway, I mean, so if I want to make sure that I'm multiplying two values and I want to make them compatible, one way is that broadcasting can do that, but I need to make sure that the broadcasting happens at the correct accesses. So I need to add those accesses in which I want the broadcasting to happen. So since I want the broadcasting to happen in the matrix, the 100 cross 100 matrix axis, so I'm adding two new accesses inside the mask so that it can broadcast over these two axes and then uh, it can, uh, and it will automatically broadcast in the way those 100 values 
R. Uh, so is this clear? I mean, why we are adding these new two accesses? It's all based on the concept of broadcasting. So this is something a complicated concept, but it's a very wonderful concept. Okay. So all of this story has happened because see the mask that was just a hundred dimensional batches comma hundred. However, the uh, internal the matrix, the attention matrix was going to be hundred comma hundred. So to make both of them compatible, uh, this all of story has happened that why we had added new access. But I just wanted to say that we had just added new access to make it compatible. I wanted to actually show that why these have been made compatible as well. And that's because of broadcasting. So now comes the attention module. Okay, so we had initialized the multi-head attention module initially. Okay, so we have given the number of heads, the embedding dimensions. So all we need to do is pass all of the data to the multi-head attention module. So we can see in the MHA, we have to the QKV, the three values and the mask. That's optional, but of course we have the mask. So we are, giving query as query as X, that is my uh, output of the, after my positional layer, value as X and key as also X, that is uh, compute the attention within the English language itself. It's computing the attention within the English language itself. Okay. And I also am providing the mask, that is my attention mask, padding mask, so that mask all of those values uh, which were padded. So this is, the, so this will automatically compute this whole computation that is shown in this figure that it will take VKQ. Uh, it will perform this scale dot product attention using mask uh, at multiple heads. So it will take care of this whole MHA on its own. So MHA is a layer that now has been incorporated by Keras. Keras. Okay. Finally, we will get the attention output. That is the output after MHA here. So we are here now the attention output after MHA. So at this attention output, I'm adding my initial X, uh, X that I got. So I'm adding this X. So this was my X, I'm adding X. And then I'm adding my layer norm after this. And after, uh, so after adding layer norm, I'm getting projection input. I'm passing this projection input to my FFN to getting projection output. And then I'm finally adding my projection input to projection output. That is, I'm adding these, this add. And then I'm finally applying the layer norm two. That is the feed forward network layer norm. And then I'm returning the output that I get after applying the layer norm. That is my this output I'm returning from the encoder. So this is my encoder model. So okay. one question. Yeah. Uh, where is the so it says add a norm right where is the addition of the residuals which i was mentioning right where does that is that inside the layer norm function itself? no 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 here okay okay so the projection input is added with projection output so the projection input so this was a projection input and this is my projection output so i'm adding both of them okay okay yeah so and for the first case it was norm, x plus I'm adding. and for the first case it was x plus attention output yeah Thank you, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is my encoder model. Okay, similarly, now I'm going to have my decoder model. So let's come here, see the decoder model. Again, I'm having the French language. Again, this whole positional layer will be used, used to do all the three things. Now I have two MHAs, one FFN, and three normalization layers, one dense layer. Okay. So I'm having two MHS. One is mass multi end attention. One is non, the simple one. Okay. One feed forward, three norms, one final dense layer. Okay. So let's first initialize. So I can initialize the positional embedding. I can initialize my first multi head attention. I can initialize my second. Then this is my FFN. Then finally my three layer norms. Then I'm also having a dropout. So here I'm having a dropout. Okay, I'm initializing a dropout layer. And then I'm also initializing my final dense layer. That's number of decoder tokens. That is for my classification. So now again, the inputs will have two things, my text and the encoder output. 
So I will so one get... question here. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in the dense right, we don't specify the activation to be softmax. Yeah. No. So okay. The reason I am not doing this is so I'm in the loss function. I'm saying that the loss is from logits is equal to true. Okay. I actually covered it in the CNN lecture, but I will just reiterate it. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So there are two ways of uh, calling this loss. One is the normal way, okay, in which you need an activation in the last layer. And one is by calling it from logits. So when I call it from logits, it will automatically first activate my output and then apply the loss. Okay. Okay, so if I'm saying from logits is equal to true, then it will know that whatever output I'm giving to this loss function, it's uh, unactivated. Okay. Okay, so it Thank will you. apply the activation in the loss function itself. And the reason we are doing that is, see, softmax activation con contains e raised to the power, categorical cross entropy contains log. So, so if we first apply e raised to the power and then uh, perform log, this won't get cancelled out. So if we combine these two inside the loss function itself, TensorFlow has actually combined these two layers to get my final in which uh, some redundant e raised to the powers and logs have been uh, left out. So it's faster. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, that clarifies. So that's why this is my final dance left without any activation. Okay. So now the input contains two. That is my French text and my encoder output. Okay. So here is my French text and here is my encoder output. So there are two things. Okay. So now the first thing is that I need to get the casual attention mask. So what is the casual attention mask? That is the forward seeing mask that I don't want to see forward. Okay, so this is the casual attention mask that I don't want to see forward because by default, the dot product will see everywhere and I don't want to see forward. So that's why this is the casual attention mask. Okay, and then again, I'm having the positional layer which will output me the padding mask as well. Right. Okay, then I'm again, I'm now the now I want to make sure that the casual attention mask and the padding masks. So, okay, first I will get to the casual attention mask. Okay, so this is the function for casual attention mask. Okay, so now my input will be of the shape batch size, comma, sequence length. Okay, so let's say batch size is 32, comma, sequence length is 100 for simplicity. Okay, so now I have got batch size and I've got sequence length. Batch size is 32, sequence length. Now I'm creating a range of sequence length length. So now basically, so what I'm doing is, so I'm creating a range. So that is I'm creating an array of size 100 in which there are values from 0 to 99. Okay, creating a array of size 100 comma. Okay, to which I'm adding a new axis. So the axis, so I'm adding a new axis in the sense that I'm converting this into 100 comma one. Okay, making sure that it's ready for broadcasting. Then finally, I'm creating another range, but will be 100, comma, okay. Uh, range, but will be 100, comma. So now what I'm doing is that, so I'm treating one as K and the other as query, okay. One as K and the other as query. That's why I've added a new axis here uh, for broadcasting. So I'm, so I'm creating a mask. So first what I'm doing is I'm creating the value of mask. So wherever I now I is greater than J. So I is greater than equal to J, right? So this is an operation. I is a matrix, J is a matrix. Okay, now this operation, operation if you see, it will create so 100 and 100, right? Okay, uh, sorry, if I created this will be one comma 100 by default. So by default, the range function actually returns me one comma 100 and I, I'm converting this here in the sense of 100 comma one. 
Okay, so now if I am doing i is greater than j, what it will do is first it will broadcast both of them into hundred comma hundred, and then it will compare wherever the values of i is greater than j. So wherever the values of i is greater than or equal to j is, it will return true, and all the other ways it will return false. So it will create a hundred comma hundred matrix, and it will be. Uh, you can understand now it will. We have a properly masked matrix that whatever the values where i is greater than j, those values will be true, and rest all the values will be false. Okay. So Indian. basically, the lower triangle of the matrix will be false, right? Yeah, the lower triangle of the matrix will be completely false. Okay, and the uh, upper triangle of the matrix will be completely true. Then I am casting this boolean to integer that uh, the true will become one and the false will become zero. So now I have a hundred cross hundred matrix where true is one and false is zero. Okay. Then I am reshaping it in one comma hundred cross hundred. Okay. Okay. Because to make it compatible with batch size, and then I am expanding the dimension over uh, over the batch size, batch size, and I am finally uh, returning my Mask. Okay. Okay. So, so now I'm going to return the mask in the sense of batch size, comma, hundred, comma, hundred. So this is the mask that I'm going to return here. Can you please explain line sixty? How does expand dimensions work? Okay. Okay. So now what what is happening here is yeah. Yeah. So what it's doing is so expand dimensions, right? So it's give dot expand dimensions. Wait, it's batches comma minus one comma df dot constant. It's using concat function between two things. Okay, yeah. So batch size is just a single value, right? Batch size is just a single value, 32. Yeah. Hannah, its shape is by default, just it's a single scalar. Okay, so it's expanding dimensions of batch size at that axis minus one. By default, minus one means last axis. Okay, so now uh, my batch size is going to be 32 comma one an array okay it will have two values 32 1 it's sorry i should write it in this way it will be a well array having two values it's sorry sorry it will add an expansion so it will make it of the size 1 comma 1 in which uh, the value will be 32. It will just add an X. So it's saying that any array which is a one dimensional is also a one comma one dimensional is also one comma one comma one dimensional, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just saying that batch size was just one value. It's saying that this 32 value is now one comma one dimensional array. Okay. So expanding dimensions is doing that uh, over, given any system, it will expand the dimensions at the last. That is, it will expand it at the dimensions minus one. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is what expand dimensions is doing. Actually, I don't want to go into details of what exactly is happening at casual attention because I want to cover the creating the model as well. And it's already 5 p.m. So that's why I'm not actually going what's happening inside the tile, what's have, why we are concatenating in those things. But uh, but if you want any help regarding this, these all functions have their proper definitions. You can actually go through them and you can ask us doubt even later on if you have any doubts regarding these that what these functions actually do they have actually defined every other function what they do but the reason i'm uh, rushing a bit is because i want to cover the creation of the full model as well sure sure, sure. okay right so um yeah first got the casual attention mask so this casual attention mask actually says to don't look at the forward values 
forward values at all. So by saying that the whole upper triangle matrix will be a zero and the lower triangle matrix will be one. So that is anywhere where the key is greater than the next than the query, that value will be masked, okay. And then here I'm taking the minimum of padding mask and casual mask, casual mask. So because let's say I have a padding mask and casual mask as well, and I want to combine two masks. So masks are the values where are zero, those need to be masked and values where are one, those do not need to be masked. So I can just take the minimum that uh, mask. Um, so to get them both of the masks, I now I've combined both padding mask as well as the casual mask as well. Okay. So now I'm going to the self-attention one. Okay. Now uh, this self-attention one takes my French language as input. Okay. And uh, since it's taking the French language as input, it has to have the feed forward, the forward looking mask in this. Okay. So that's why the self-attention mask is actually the casual mask in this. And it's just taking my French value as the French as input as query value and key, all the three inputs. And finally it's applying addition and layer normalization. Now comes my cross attention mask. So this is my cross attention. So inside this cross attention, I am inputting my padding mask. Okay. Now the padding mask, it's important to see that padding mask is a combination of padding and casual mask that I also don't want to see forward values, but I also don't want to see padded values as well. So it's a combination of both padded as well as the casual mask. Okay. So that is the mask that I'm providing here. And here it's important to note that, see, as a query, I'm providing the output of the first MHA. So the output of the first MHA I'm providing as the query. So this will be the query, query the output of my first MHA. Okay, but as value and key, I'm providing the encoder output. That is, these were my encoder outputs. So as value and key, I'm providing my encoder outputs. So now this is my cross attention, which actually computes attention between. So the attention will be key into query, right? So attention is between query and key. So it will compute the cross attention between my encoder and my French language to understand that uh, what part of the encoder I should incorporate in my French language now. Okay, what part of the encoder I should incorporate in my French language now. And uh, after that, I'm again applying uh, uh, addition and normalization, then my projection layer, then again, addition and normalization. Then finally, I'm applying my dropout and my final dense layer for classification. So this is my decoder network. And I'm having the full decoders network. Okay, and finally, I'm combining this into my training model. Okay, now the, again for combining into training model so that I can use encoder and decoder properly, I'm actually creating encoder model and decoder model outside by the same logic as we were having previously and passing the objects rather than initializing new objects inside my training model. Okay, so I'm having the encoder model and decoder model. Okay, I'm having two inputs. That's my English language and French language. I'm passing my English language to my encoder to get the encoder output. And then I'm passing my French language and encoder output to the decoder to getting my final decoder output. And then my final model finally returns the decoder output that I'm having. So now I have created this whole transformer as the final model here, uh, here by using encoder model and decoder model. So this is how the transformer of attention is all you need paper uh, can be coded to create the encoder and the training and averaging will be same, same. Uh, we can just use model.fit, model.compile uh, for training the model and compiling the model. The rest, everything will remain. The, even the testing is pretty much similar, pretty much similar, not exactly, but pretty much similar in this case as it was in the LSTM sequence to sequence modeling case.
Uh, so okay, one so question: When we are training the decoder model, right? When we are mm -hmm. training it, do we still mask the uh, output which is coming, uh, like at, at the end, like while training? Yeah, while no, while training. See, the point is uh, so for the padding mask. See, why mask is required? There are two aspects. So first of all, I don't want the attention to be computed. So now, now see, there's no attention being computed there. Right, but that does not that. But there was some value that value is being getting propagated. It's not the value is completely lost, but just that the value is meaningless. Right at that particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. So what would happen is that value will get propagated to my final dance layer and come as an output. Oh yeah. But that okay. value was completely irrelevant to me. So that's why I need to. So I need to make sure that even the loss is not computed at this value. Okay, I need to make sure that even in loss, this value is masked. You know who to takes care of that? My positional embedding in my embedding layer. Embedding layer actually takes care of the fact. So this is for padding mask only. Okay, because for look ahead masks, I'm just masking partially. I'm not masking fully, I'm masking partially. Okay, so the value still yeah. makes sense, right? But for padding mask, I'm masking fully. So the value is completely irrelevant for me. So whenever I'm creating a padding mask, so when, while creating a padding mask, I'm using an embedding layer, okay? And inside this embedding layer, by default in an embedding layer, the mask true, the, I use this parameter here, right? Mask zero is true. So I'm saying to this embedding layer that you need to mask all the values that was zero. So, so since we are creating our own MHA and other layers, uh, those won't, won't be able to understand the mask of the embedding layer. However, uh, you know who will be able to understand? The loss will be able to understand the mask of the embedding layer. Embedding layer. So embedding layer will take care of the fact that wherever there was padding mask, padding mask at that position's loss should not be computed. Okay. Makes sense. Thanks. See, these codes actually are a bit uh, advanced codes. They, they have a lot of uh, inbuilt systems that, sorry, inbuilt concepts uh, they're utilizing. Like again, object oriented programming, broadcasting, and so many different functions you are seeing that you have not seen the range style uses of so many different functions. Plus the whole object oriented programming concept is new. I can understand that uh, it might seem that it's complicated, but uh, yeah, practice, I mean, uh, it will just come by practice, that's it. Okay, so uh, any more doubts? Okay, so that's it for that. How much practice is needed? <laughs> you are saying <laughs> it is looking very complex to me. Hey. See how much practice is needed. Uh, I'm, how much like, did you practice? <laughs> I've been working for more than four and a half years now. Uh, but I mean, I can say that uh, the turning point for me where I was confident that I can at least understand every code in written in TensorFlow was around after a year, but I got so confident that that's like that light bulb moment that I was like, yeah, give me any TensorFlow code, I will understand what's going inside it. Yeah, I cannot write everything, but I can understand. And I can use those to create my own codes. Doug, sir, from where to start for business? Yeah, for business, one of the very important aspects is see, uh, take up a problem, 
okay then take up a, a state of the art of that problem that you want to beat take a state of the art whose code is also available so understand what they have done and understand their code okay so that is the very first way to understand their code you would have to look at so many different things uh, you would have to try different why this you won't understand that why this is happening so you will actually go to google collab create a dummy numpy arrays and work with those dummy so so that is how i i there was one code by google called facenet i actually took it took me the like three to four weeks to understand that code fully but after that i understood that code that i was so confident that oh so this is how people use tensorflow and yes now i can understand every tensorflow code so that's how you pick up a problem. You pick up a state of gear whose code is available and try to understand the complete code. Okay, because mere bhi matlab abhi itna wo samajh mein nahi aa raha hai break bhi hua hai na beech mein. So sir, how how efficient are these courses like IBM AI or IBM data science courses that are there? Are they worth doing or like or directly should I jump into Keras and all those things and just read the codes? I have completed these courses, uh, the IBM Skill Academy. So they are uh, good, good for beginners, right? You will gain a lot of things from them. Uh, okay, so they might cover basics of Python. That's actually really important. I mean, the things that we are not covering, like broadcasting. So these things, how numpy arrays, lists, uh, dictionaries, sets. So these loop how to efficiently use loops and all of these things the many functions that you are seeing in this code like enumerate zip python functions what they are doing those things will get you will definitely get clarity of the basics from there of coding there is one course deep learning with tensorflow and machine learning with uh, python this is from google uh, this ibm skill academy so these are really good courses uh, they give a good background for this ai Okay, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Your good name. Uh, my name is Kushal Kumar. I am PhD okay, from okay. Punjab University. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will uh, contact you. Your number. You would be in your that WhatsApp group, now. Yeah, yeah, yes. So yes, I will sir. ask you about more details. Thank you. No sir. problem. So, uh, sir, Daksh, sir, there is one thing I want to share with other participant and uh, with you. So, sir suggested a book. Uh, Aditya sir suggested a book that this is neural network classroom approach by Satish Kumar. Sir, okay. so yes, sir. I have read it. Uh, so I have read it, chapter four. So the and after this, the my understanding is very crisp about these functions. So the whatever uh, written in this book is in very lucid form. So this is, I think, this is a very yeah. good book to start. So this yeah. is my experience. yeah. You can start there. I mean, yes, to have a basic so, knowledge. So book is available like online soft copy is available or like. Am I purchased just uh, it's hard copy uh, when the day oh, Aditya okay. says it. From okay, okay, sir. So just, just uh, can you just, just uh, once type this name in the uh, in the group that that the workshop group? Uh, yes, sir. I will type. Share, definitely, ma'am. I will post his picture. Also. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome. Okay, so yeah. Anyone is having any doubts? Uh, 